The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. It all starts now. Think of somebody's wedding that you've been at years ago. And you may know people like that where everything seemed to be working so perfectly, but now as before your very eyes, you are watching their relationship start to come apart. What do you do and when do you say something when some people that you love, that you're close to, have a marriage that is crumbling right before your eyes? I'd like to invite you to dig into God's wonderful word with me today to work on a strategy to see things from his point of view and to gain some wisdom from his wonderful words, to know what to say and when, when you have a friend who has a marriage that is coming apart. Last week, I talked to you uh, starting a new Bible study series called I Have a Friend, and we tackled the tough issue of what do you do when somebody you know is caught up in an addiction? Today, I'd like to tackle an equally tough topic. What do you do when you have a friend whose marriage is really weak and you're afraid may even be coming apart? I'd like to invite you to dig with me into the Word. And St. Paul had some powerful things to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Would you look that up with me? Grab a Bible if it's near you or if you have a tablet or a smartphone. Corinth was a huge city full of temptation. I kind of think of it as the Chicago of the Mediterranean world. It wasn't the premier city. Rome was the biggest. But Corinth was right up there after number one. Hundreds of thousands of people, and they were a major crossroads of trade, communication, education, and military power, strategic transport, Uh, in the ancient world. It was lay on a crossroads. So it made sense, instead of sailing cargo around Sparta, around the Peloponnesus and up the other side, it actually made economic sense to unload the cargo of the big ships and, and portage it across the isthmus and reload it. Or, in the case of smaller vessels, they literally dragged the ships right across a track and plopped them in on the other side of the isthmus. That's how important Corinth was, and it sat right on top of that strategic location. What that meant was that the people that Paul had helped evangelize and build a congregation out of, they were a counterculture. They were surrounded by people who had no use for what they were saying and believing in and were constantly at risk of Satan beating them down and making them think they were stupid for being in such a minority. How do you hold on to your faith when you're a minority when everybody else seems to be against you or does not believe in what you say? How can you hold up the sacredness of marriage when there is a place to worship the goddess of love at the top of the hill and the priests that you were brought up with are telling you that this is the way that you can please the gods? Well, Paul taught them a better way and he's going to teach us a better way too. Let's, let's read this. Paul writes, Now for the matters you wrote about, He had gotten messengers uh, who had delivered letters and itemized how this congregation was being troubled. There were many problems in that congregation in Corinth. They were completely full of cliques and little groups uh, resenting one another and being overly proud of their own group and who they followed. They were always quarreling and fighting with each other. Here's another problem. Now for the matters you wrote about. It's good for a man not to marry. Now, that's, that's insane. You think, here, I'm going to be talking to you about how awesome it is to be married, and it kicks off with, isn't it awesome to be single? <laughs> that's a paradox, isn't it? It's, see, it's a seeming contradiction, and yet they're both true. Is it, is it better to be single, or is it better to be, marriage, uh, to be married? And the answer is yes. They're both awesome. You don't ever have it all. When you're single, and Paul recommended it. He said, it's good for you not to marry. In verse 7, he says, I wish all men were as I am, single. Uh, To unmarried people and to widows, somebody whose husband has died, I say, it's good for them to stay unmarried. That's in verse 8. So three times he says the single life. Ah, that's the life. He loved being single. 
He had the gift of chastity. I'm sure he felt sexual temptation from Satan, but he was able to control it. And he said, you know what? You never have everything. I have my independence. I love my ability to travel. I can throw myself into what my passion is, which is evangelism and proclaiming the Word of God. I am wired to be a church planter, and I'm also called to do that. I can put my life at risk and don't have to worry that I will leave a widow and orphans behind. I love my life. So he says, it's good not to marry, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So there he says, but I wish everyone were married. Can, is your brain big enough to hold two conflicting ideas at the same time without going insane? They're both true. And your situation in life will determine how you handle what you're dealing with. Each man should have his own wife because there's so much immorality. Nothing has changed. And don't underestimate your own vulnerability. If you have a pretty healthy sexual appetite, put serious energy into dating and finding a life partner so that you may laugh at the devil and have sex whenever you want without sinning so that you have a spouse. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. You're one flesh now. In God's crazy wedding math, the day after the wedding, in God's crazy mathematics, one plus one equals one. So don't use yourself. Don't play games with it. Don't allow the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife to be a power game where you use it for leverage to gain advantage, either by giving or withholding. That's a very dangerous game, the nuclear game, and that is a great way to fry your partner. That should be just about the last thing you do to get what you want and be super careful of that. And as a single guy, Paul was an amazingly attuned to this. God must have tipped him off how important this is as his spirit inspired him to write these things down. Do not deprive each other, meaning to be apart, except by mutual consent. Like it's a, like we've got some things we need to work on and we need a timeout. And for a time, with an with a expiration date so that we have a time when you come back together. I got to tell you that separation is an option that I am aware of that God puts his sort of tentative blessing on. And I've talked to couples over the years that I thought needed a timeout, but I don't recommend it very cheerfully and I don't do it very often because uh, it can boomerang. And if you're already feeling kind of emotionally disconnected, if you're already having problems communicating, if you already feel like your lives are like drift, drifting apart, you know, they're diverging, now living apart, is only going to make it worse. If you're having trouble communicating, not being in the same room or not being in the same house anymore is probably not going to make your communication any better. So that is an extreme option, but it needs to be done with a plan. It needs to be done mutually so that you both realize we got to work on some things and that you pray about it and then you come back together prayerfully with a reunification time pre-planned. Otherwise, this can just be step one to the crack up of the family. Then come together again. Why? So that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You have an enemy who is trying to destroy your marriage. And as you are pondering, and I asked you today to think about a couple that you know who's having problems, think about them right now. Satan is going after them in any way he can think of to have them fry their patience with each other, to steal away and drain off their love, to make them jittery and impatient, to let their anger and resentment boil up, to let their memory of past grudges and grievances and wounds uh, keep those wounds unhealed, keep rubbing salt in them, keep those wounds bleeding and infected. Don't ever let anything heal and get them so upset and angry and exhausted and miserable 
that they would rather have anything, any kind of life, other than being chained to this tormentor. That's how Satan is whispering and working. And he's coming at every marriage because the, by destroying your marriage, he has a, a way to get his pry bar into your relationship with your God, too. Those two thing, those things go hand in hand. It's the same as your relationship with your children and your relationship with God are all of a fabric, and when he damages one, he will almost certainly damage the other. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish you all could be like I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another that. So he's saying that my singleness is a gift. I know that I have the gift uh, you might recall that when Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees were talking about marriage one day, uh, the disciples were shocked that Jesus said God's intent from the beginning was that you would be married till death us do part. And the Pharisees didn't want to hear that. They thought they believed in no-fault divorce, that if a husband gets tired of her, all he's got to do is get a certificate and give it to her so that she can prove it's not he's ditching me not because I committed adultery. I am not an adulteress. I am not an other woman. I am not a tramp. It's your, I'm not a tramp letter to certify that you're, you're still marriageable. That's what the Pharisees wanted. When Jesus' disciples heard him say, till death us do part, they shook their heads and said, oh man, like I'm stuck with, for life? Seriously? If that's the way it is with marriage, it would be better what do they say? Not to marry. Jesus' countercultural words were so shocking, even his friends were shocked to hear that that's what marriage really was like in God's design and intent. So I guess this is just always going to be a countercultural idea. Some more. I already talked about verse 8. On to. Uh, on to verse 10. Now, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. And it, it's not saying, he's not saying, well, I don't agree with this, but God said it. He just means the Lord already brought this up. He's quoting the Gospels. He already knew what Jesus had said years earlier. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Jesus said that, right? We're all clear on that. That doesn't need elaboration. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. And you've got to understand what he means by that. He doesn't mean I'm offering now my personal advice, but this isn't a direct teaching of God. That's not at all what he means. What he means is that Jesus himself in the Gospels never addressed this particular point. I am telling you this. You won't hear this quoted from the lips of Christ himself, but I'm telling you this, but it still is coming it still is the Word of God. And a little aside on that, some people think that the only teachings about human behavior you really have to pay attention to are those words that come directly from Jesus and everything else in the New Testament is of human origin. That is pure baloney. That is something that God never said or intended. All of his word from Genesis to Revelation is given to us through divine inspiration and revealing. All of it is profitable for us to listen to and be governed by. All of it carries authority from God. And there is a load of information of historical incidents and doctrine and teachings that come from the book of Acts through the end of Revelation, and it all is applicable to you and to me, including these words right here. So here's what Paul says. If any brother has a wife who's not a believer, and she's willing to live with them. He must not divor divorce her. Like if you are two unbelievers and one of them comes to faith and your partner won't come along, that does not give you the right to ditch him. Stay with him. Maybe you can bring him along. If a woman has a husband who's not a believer, he is willing to live with her. She must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has often been sanctified through his wife. In other words, it, it, it happens that the believer slowly over time pulls the unbeliever along and that person then later in life comes to faith. Or vice versa, the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing children. Think of the kids. 
Otherwise, your children would be unclean. If you are the Christian and you cut loose, you take off from your family, what about your children that you're leaving behind? They will then grow up as unbelievers, but as it is, they are holy. In other words, they are receiving uh, the washing of forgiveness through your in inspiration, and they are also receiving God's words through your faithful teaching. So the fact that you may have a Christian and unchristian married together, there are ways to make that work if, the person, if they're both willing. But, verse 15, and here next to committing adultery, here is the only other place where the Scripture gives a Christian moral freedom to seek a divorce. If the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. To ditch your relationships, to do behaviors that destroy the marriage relationship are the actions, words, and deeds of an unbeliever. And if one partner is persistent in doing that, the believer is not obligated to stay chained into a relationship where the person has adopted the actions of an unbeliever. Which, of course, is a statement of principle. Now, applying that, of course, is, is really hard. We're not going to get into that today. What I would like to do is have just a so what moment with you now and say, what, did, what have we learned by this little essay on God's intent and on relationships and what's important? First of all, to know what God really intended. Realize that marriage is not something that our culture has produced or is a human invention that can flex and change. This is God's timeless intent invented all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. And Jesus himself quotes Genesis 2 to show what God's intent was. He told the people at the time that no-fault divorce was not God's intent from the beginning. God put up with your behaviors. And notice he didn't say their behaviors. He's talking to Pharisees in real time with him, and he said, your hearts were hard. In other words, the same reason why God tried to bring some order out of a terribly messy situation was not because it was right, but because he was trying to protect people in the middle of societal meltdown. And he tried to give women a little bit of dignity so that they would be able to find another husband and would not be branded as some kind of tramp and be unmarriageable. This was the age, of course, when there were no government benefit programs and where if it wasn't for your family, you were cruelly at the mercy of um, survival tactics. And so God had Moses tell the people of Israel to, the, to those tribal leaders, to the men, if you are going to d ditch your wives, you must give them some documents to show that this is just your change of taste. You are not blaming them for committing adultery. Hopefully they will be able to find another husband. But it's because of the hardness of your hearts. And he looked right at him and said, those same poisonous attitudes live within you. And he saw the same thing happening with his disciples. First of all, have the courage to tell the truth. What good is it to have friends if you're messing up and they don't give it straight to you? That's why we need our friends to tell us when we're talking foolishness, to tell us when we're acting like idiots. But they have the right to expect the same from you. Tell people the truth in love. Call it what it is. Show an interest in what's going on in their homes. If they are acting badly, if you know one of your man friends has got some kind of action going on on the side, don't just laugh. Don't just say, well, his home life must be miserable, and so he's got to go get a little uh, honey someplace. Go, i got to go get his own little sugar on the side. Don't let him get away with that. Tell him you are committing marital and spiritual suicide. The previous chapter says in uh, 1 Corinthians, just the previous chapter, chapter 6, says that adulterers and marriage wreckers will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you live like that without repenting, you're, you're going to risk forfeiting your salvation because it's a direct contradiction to the revealed will of God. Tell them, though, not only the bad news, but tell them the good news, too. Give people hope. 
First of all, come with some humility because you may not have such a perfect stainless record yourself. If you're going to advise somebody else on how to be married, they may look at your marriage and say, well, yours don't look so hot either. Or they know some of your weaknesses or slip-ups. The fact that you have sinned does not disqualify you from speaking because you know and embrace the fact that you need the forgiveness of sins for yourself, and you now are able to offer that same comfort to people who have a string of bad decisions behind them. It's hard to change if you don't feel there's hope. If all we do as Christians is just lay out more rules to people, they'll say, I've had enough rules. I'm going to figure this out by myself. But when you give them hope, that God can wash away the guilt of your deeds of the past. It gives you a little bit of encouragement that you can step forward and that God still has some good things for you. For what he's interested in is a repentant heart, not just people who are pretty good at keeping his rules, but his rules are there for protection of people. They're good for us. What he's really interested in is a living relationship, one that allows God to speak to us to show us where we are in need of a Savior, but then give us the awesome message of God's unconditional love through Christ Jesus. That's a load of stuff for you to be thinking about. But I encourage you not just to stay mum, as people within your extended family and people in your friend network are going through various struggles. Hold up God's beautiful design. I know we're all sinners and we all fall short, but here is the path to a happy life. This is what God designed and where his blessings come from. The Spirit will give you words. The Spirit will give people the power and ability to think straight. The Spirit will give people, through his word, the power to act on what their minds have then become convinced is the right thing to do. For looking for good in people is what Jesus does to us. In fact, basically, that's just treating people the way Jesus Christ treats us, with unconditional love, meaning you give worth to people, not based on their past performance. To choose to forgive. If you never forgive your partner, you will simply accumulate resentments indefinitely. As Christ has washed away all your sins, you can choose to see yourself as loved and forgiven, and you can choose to see your own spouse and your own family members as unconditionally loved and completely forgiven, and you can inspire other people to show that same mercy to the people in their lives. Heavenly Father, you love marriage. Help us to love it as much as you do. Lord Jesus, you are the one who makes it possible for one sinner to live with another sinner. As you have washed us and made us clean, may we love and forgive each other. Holy Spirit, teach us to think straight and act right. Amen. Jesus wants his people to be known for their love. And we want to help you love others in a culture where homosexuality is the new normal by sending you a brand new resource called Gay and God. Gay and God is our gift to thank you for your donation to help Time of Grace continue broadcasting on this station. So be sure to request yours when you give today. Call 800-661-3311, text TIME to 313131, or visit timeofgrace.org forward slash store. I'd like to tell you about a new feature here at Time of Grace, which we call Your Time of Grace. These are short videos that are brought to people in a variety of different ways, through mobile device, through YouTube, or through Facebook. And they feature short little content by roughly half a dozen different pastors besides me to bring the gospel to people in a little different way. And we've been delighted to see that already millions of people have viewed these Your Time of Grace videos. I'd like to introduce you today to another pastor in the series. His name is Pastor. Pastor Jared Oldenburg. He served various congregations here in the Midwest, but also in the Northwest. And he and his wife and their family currently live in Colorado. I'd like to introduce him to you as he presents a little, short little message called How to Live Wisely. 
Hey, I'm Jared. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about time and what would you say is your biggest time sink? If it's anywhere close to mine, it's probably the internet and there's a reason for that. I just saw a stat that said uh, 100 years ago the amount of information a person received in an entire lifetime is the amount of information that you and I receive every single day. I looked up what the number one searches were from last year and they were this. How do I use the update for Snapchat? How do I solve the Rubik's Cube, which is, that's legit, I looked that up. And then how do I receive legendary marks? I had no idea what that was, so now of course I added to the stats by looking that up. Now that stuff's pretty harmless, but there's a lot of images that come, there's a lot of things that you look, there's a lot of sites that you look at that are not necessarily so great. God issues this warning. He says, be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. That means take stock of the things you're looking at. Take stock at the things that are going in your brain. Because he goes on to say, the days are evil. There's so much content that we have, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting the right content. How about searches like, how do I love my spouse more completely? Or how do I find fulfillment at work? Or what does God have to say? Or science says this, what does God say? Why does it matter? It probably doesn't matter if you know how to use the Rubik's Cube or not. But when it comes to time, there are images that you never forget. And these images and these videos and these sites change the way you look at yourself. They change the way you look at relationships. They change the way you look at God. And you don't just have any God. You have a God that loves you. You have a God who cares about you. You have a God who really is concerned about what's best for you so that you can have life, as Jesus says, and have it to the full. I want to take just a moment to say a big thank you to all of you whose steady and ongoing regular financial support makes Time of Grace possible. I truly think of you as my partners, my partners in proclaiming the grace of God. If you haven't recently made a financial contribution to Time of Grace, let me ask you today to pray and consider your best gift and join the team so that you can be my partner as well. I'd like to pray with you today about that person in your life that you're watching with a marriage that might be unraveling right in front of your eyes. Let's ask God for his help, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for some wisdom to know when and how to be helpful to someone with a struggling marriage. Help us to be great listeners. Help us to care about their marriage as much as you do. Help us never to give up. Help us to help them know how to think of one another again, how to talk to each other again. Most of all, how to be forgiven by you and to forgive each other. Help us, Lord, to be healers of the marriages around us. In Jesus' name, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske, celebrating the freedom that God gives us in His grace. And it all starts now. It all starts now. It all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.